So what is Seneca virus? Going to give you a little bit of background on the virus itself and then start to go through a couple of case studies. And then hopefully what we've learned a little bit from uh, diagnostics and epidemiology about this virus today. Uh, a little bit of background, it's a non-enveloped single-stranded RNA virus from the family Picornaviridae and you've heard uh, both our previous speakers uh, talk about it. It is in the same family and clinically indistinguishable from foot and mouth virus. That's why it's so important that we continue to be very vigilant. You'll hear this message repeated several times about if you see anything like the slides I'm about to show you, contact your veterinarian. He will work with the state and federal officials if they decide it looks similar enough. We need to verify that this is Seneca Valley virus and not foot and mouth disease. Otherwise, what we do is we run the risk of becoming complacent in this, and before we know it, it's going to be all over the country and it becomes much harder to, uh, to try to clean up and eradicate. So... And really, we talk a lot about foot and mouth disease virus. There's actually four different viruses. Uh, most of them are on Dr. Sundberg's list. They're, they're all considered uh, swine vesicular disease or swine vesicular disease viruses. They're all foreign animal uh, diseases, so it's not ones that we have currently today. So we want to make sure that we're being very vigilant and getting those reported. Like you say, it's not a new disease, so we'll talk a little bit more about what we think happened, but it's actually a disease that's been reported uh, since the late 80s, so it's just that was just a handful of cases where they would get these calls, just like what Dr. Schmidt explained, hey, I've got some vesicles, I need to investigate this further, and they would test them for the four, the four foreign animal diseases, and they would all show up negative, and they just got lumped into this bucket called idiopathic vesicular disease meaning it's some sort of vesicular disease, we don't know what it is, but in the late 80s they were able to describe it, but like we say up until this last summer, you know, it was kind of the deal we'd see two to four cases a year across the United States. There was a lot of questions actually about, well, okay, is it, once we were able to diagnose it, once we developed the, the diagnostic test to it, you know, is there clear association, does it definitively cause that? And really, a joint study here with some uh, help from uh, the Swine Health Information Center uh, between USDA, the animal research uh, researchers over there in Iowa State, we completed a study where we were able to take this virus that we recovered from some of these cases, give it back to naive pigs, and recreate the disease. So there was some question recently, but I think uh, with the group over there, Drs. Kelly Lager, Nestor Montiel, Amanda Buckley, were able to definitively prove that it is Seneca Valley virus that causes this idiopathic vesicular disease. So I want to spend most of my time just explaining what we've seen uh, and really showing you lots of pictures, if nothing else, just to make you really aware of what this looks like. So if you ever happen to come across this in your facilities, you know that you need to get uh, your veterinarian and the state and federal officials involved. As Dr. Schmidt talked about, uh, first couple of cases were in exhibition swine. Near the end of July, though, there was a, uh, a finishing barn that had a report of acute lameness and vesicular lesions on the snout and feet. I think by this time we'd been involved with two or three of the uh, vesicular uh, disease investigations with the uh, uh, exhibition swine. So we had the uh, opportunity working with the veterinarian on site uh, to do some additional research on it, do some investigations. And what was really kind of nerve-wracking about it was the prevalence was really high. If you talk to the, to the producer, he's like, well, I looked at them on Wednesday night, they were fine, I came in Thursday morning, and I had four or five pigs in every pen that wouldn't get up, wouldn't get up at all. Um, and they, these were pigs that were market weight animals, so they were getting ready to go to market, which creates another issue that Dr. Schmidt touched on earlier. The veterinarian was called. He reported the, uh, uh, the, to the state and federal veterinarians. They sent the animal disease diagnostician in to collect samples uh, and that were sent off, and they were negative for vesicular diseases. Uh, as Dr. Schmidt mentioned, they had the ability to split the samples to test them for foot and mouth disease, and we had Seneca Valley virus PCRs in a, a research lab at Iowa State, so we went ahead and tested them at the same time as the uh, samples went out to the, to the lab in Plum Island. And in both cases, they were negative for everything except for Seneca Valley virus or Seneca virus A. So as we did, we had the ability to go in and do a, a disease investigation. And what we came up with through this two to three hour interview process about what were some of the potential risk factors, what was interesting about it was 
The first clinical signs were on July 15th. On July 10th, or five days earlier, they had taken the first cut of market pigs out and sold them to slaughter. Um, so we said, well, okay, so what were all the processes that were involved with that? A couple of risk factors that we found. One was the market truck that came in was not washed and disinfected. It was, it was still dirty. And in addition to that, the truck driver had gotten out, gotten into his trailer, and as the staff was getting ready to load the truck, he was walking in and out of his truck and into the building as well. So if there was something, we don't know for sure, the boy, I won't be able to tell you what definitively caused it, but that's certainly risky behavior. If you had an unclean truck and then the truck driver happened to walk out of the trailer and into the barn, uh, if that trailer was carrying something, that would be a good way to ensure that you're able to get it transmitted to the rest of the pigs. The other thing that we noticed was it was the grower, but he also had a commercial loading crew, two or three individuals that go around to several different farms and load pigs as well. So those were probably two of the more risky uh, things that we learned during that disease investigation. So from that first initial report of clinical signs over the next 10 to 14 days, uh, almost 80 to 90 percent of the pigs had some sort of lesions. They tended to have vesicular lesions either around the coronary bands on the feet, like Dr. Schmidt have, and I'll show you some additional pictures along with that, or lameness. And then reports of um, the pigs, you know, I, the question was, well, did the, were, they, were they dying? Were they thin? They're like, no, they were still able to get to the feeder. They would just crawl on their knees in order to get there. I'm like, well, that's different. We don't normally see that at all either. So, um, you know, of the cases that have been reported, this has probably been the highest prevalence of animals with some sort of lesions. But uh, in the finishing pigs, that's what we really saw. Hopefully these will show up okay. Oh, thank you very much. Hey. Thank you very much. What you'll see here are some pictures uh, several weeks into this outbreak here. So what you're seeing here, this is a ruptured vesicle on the nose that's beginning to heal. Those, uh, it was rare to find, um, by the time that we had gotten up to there, it had been a couple weeks into it, to find new big fresh vesicles, but we saw lots of these. So ones that had vesicles, it, the blister pop, pops in the truest sense, and then they really heal fairly quickly. There's one, uh, one that we actually did happen to find that was more, it's a little bit hard to tell here in the picture, but you've kind of got a, a fluid filled pocket there right on the snout. We also tend to see a lot of these uh, deep nail bed hemorrhages, and I, I'm not sure, I haven't, you don't always look at feet if you don't see pigs that are lame to know how common this was, but certainly a, a few weeks into, into this outbreak in this case when we got up there, that was something that we noticed, and, and we know that uh, the virus has an affinity for uh, some of the tissues in and around the coronary bands, around the hoofs. So you can certainly see it almost look like you know somebody hit them. Like if you hit your thumb with a hammer, right? You get that deep bruise. Now these tend to be more reddish than than that dark bruising color, but uh, certainly there was something going on there that was certainly different. Here's what you see there is uh, these are called hygromas. So this is where the pig was crawling to the feeder. You know, and you start to get kind of rough skin. You tend to uh, lose some of the hair off that as well. So, so we were able to go into that herd. The veterinarian went back about 14 days after the initial outbreak. We confirmed that it was Seneca and it wasn't anything else. He was able to get some additional samples for us because we were trying to determine what was the appropriate sample type. So. This graph here was samples, uh, three different samples that he collected. He collected some from the, the fluid from those little vesicles on the snout or on the feet. He collected some nasal swabs, some in and around the nose, some from the serum or the blood, and then we hung some ropes in that facility as well to collect some moral fluids. And how you read that is, these are PCCT values, so they, they, the moral story is they were almost all positive, but the lower that CT value is an, an approximation for how much virus is there. So a low number means more virus. And what you can see is obviously the best samples were this vesicular fluid or scrapings around and erosion on the nose that was starting to heal. We could find the most virus in them, but also this oral fluid actually was, was a very good sample of uh, find, detecting the virus in a population and a really a whole lot easier sample to collect. There you can see those are kind of in that 18 to 22. Generally when you see any, any uh, uh, CT values in the teens to low 20s, that just means there's an awful lot of virus there. So oral fluids look like it was going to be a very good sample for detecting that. 
So two weeks after that, we hung a whole bunch of ropes in different pens in that barn, and you can see two weeks later, there's still a fair amount of virus in that, in that environment. Your CT values are in the mid to the upper teens. So four weeks after that clinical break, we could go in there. By this time, most of the animals were, had their lesions were resolved, um, but we could still find a fair amount of virus. So it really made us felt good that oral fluids were going to be a good antemortem uh, sample if you're trying to detect if you had the virus in that population or not. And really what they did, a lot of good co coordination between the state veterinarians, the veterinarian on site, the federal officials, what they did is they just allowed plenty of time for the pigs, for all those lesions and lameness to subside. So after about 30 days, they took their time, got some flat uh, uh, straight deck trucks, they didn't put them in pots, and they were able to go ahead and sell the remaining pigs in that building without incidents. Actually, they just euthanized one or two pigs at site that were still questionable. Everything else went into the normal channels without any issues at all. And it, through lots of communication with the FSIS uh, inspectors and the packers as well. So I think that would be one of the other me messages to say if you do have it, contact your state and federal officials. Uh, give give the if they're if they're growing pigs, just give them enough time to heal. We want to make sure we're not sending any actively lame with any pigs with any sort of vesicles like that into the marketing channels because of the potential uh, problems that it causes that Dr. Schmidt uh, referenced in his earlier talk. Uh, there was also a second finishing case probably about a month later in, an, uh, in the same ge geographic area and that one presented very differently. This time it was only 10 to 15 percent of the pigs affected and they were able to just sit on them and two weeks later those pigs had resolved. There weren't any new cases and went ahead and sold the rest of that building without any further issues. So about the time that we started seeing these cases, we were very fortunate to be able to hire Dr. Daniel Linhares, who had done a PhD with Bob Morrison at PERS at the University of Minnesota, had gone back to work with a group back in Brazil. And what was really interesting about it was, like his second day on the job, we started talking about it, and they're like, well, yeah, this has been going on in Brazil for the last you know, 10 to 12 months prior to that. So he was able to give us a little bit of insight of what that what this presentation looks, because there's some things that look different, but some things look the, look the same. Uh, so he was able to give us some uh, clue as to what to look for, and what he really spoke to us about was, in sow farms, what they would see is this really high neonatal mor morbidity and mortality in really young pigs. So it'd be whole litters of pigs would look off, and then a few hours later, the whole litter might be dead, or most of the pigs in the litter might be dead. So we started then to screen for cases of this. Now, a lot of times we'd have pigs, a lot of the common complaints is they'd come in, piglets with diarrhea less than seven days. What was unusual about it is the, di the, the veterinarian, submitting veterinarian would say, well, yeah, but we're losing a lot of these pigs. Generally, if you treat them, you, don't, you may lose one or two, but you don't lose whole litters, and that was what was different. So uh, we started to screen for cases like this, started to run uh, um, some Seneca Valley virus PCRs on it, some of the other history that we were getting along with it is, well, we'd have some sows that might have an, uh, a fever in and around the time that they feral. Uh, never really had cases where sows were completely off feed. Uh, but maybe not eating all that they should they should eat, and then generally, by the time that we figured out uh, as we got to the diagnosis of what the problem really was, uh, the mortality kind of went away, and the clinical signs disappeared as well. So the pathologist, after Daniel kind of described what he was seeing, uh, what they were seeing in Brazil, started to screen some of these cases, and lo and behold, we started finding uh, positive pig cases uh, with that kind of signalment. Generally, most of the time, there wasn't a discussion or a description or a complaint from the people working in the barn, anything about vesicles on, on the nose or on the snout, and, and in our experiences, didn't have uh, uh, any, really any significant lameness with it either. There have been a couple other South Farm reports where there was more obvious lameness than there were in most of the cases that we saw, but... Once the once the uh, the diagnosis was made, then we you know we the pathologist would speak to the veterinarian. The veterinarian would go in the next day and then report back. Well, yeah, there's the pigs look fine, but there may be 10, 20, even up to 40 percent of the sows in the building have these vesicles on their snout or on their feet. 
What's interesting though, what they saw uh, was really this high neonatal mortality. They weren't seeing any lesions like that, so no lesions on the nose, no lesions on the feet in the piglets. Uh, just just this, mort this really high mortality in pigs less than seven days of age. And then even when, when we went ahead and tested them, we could find ev lot, evidence of lots of virus in these pigs. But when you look at their tissues underneath the microscope looking for lesions, we couldn't find any. So really the thing to watch out for, I would say, in the South Farm cases is really high mortality in really young pigs. Uh, I would say Seneca virus should be on your differential list. Upon further inspection, some of the things that once you really got in and started looking at it, you could find a few cells that would have vesicles on their nose. We probably saw a lot more lesions on the feet. So in and around that nail bed, and I'll show you pictures uh, on there, you know, some lesions, uh, you know, and uh, we would see uh, in cells that were, had litters that were unaffected, some, they would, some that they were clearly affected. So we would see... Uh, it kind of an inconsistent pattern, and it wouldn't be all the sows in the, uh, these young feral rooms. It would just be 10, 20, maybe up to 40% of them would be affected. So I'll show you some photos of what we saw on, on some of these breeding herd farms. This would be a typical one. You've got kind of this litter here to the left. You know, not looking very good. Probably already lost a couple of pigs. We've seen it both with and without diarrhea, but it, for whatever reason, diarrhea tended to be uh, more associated with some of these litters. And then this is the litter right next door, right over the panel, and the litter would look completely fine. So very sporadic in the incidence of, of those really affected litters. Another example one, you've got uh, clearly a fairly healthy litter, and then here this litter off to the right there already lost several pigs, and the other ones um, don't look very well and probably had to have been euthanized as well. So going around doing some more uh, additional diagnostics, you know, you certainly can still see the vesicles. There's a ruptured vesicle on the nose. Here's kind of a healing or erosion on the bottom of the feet. You can see there that sow laying in the farrowing crate. Uh, now she wouldn't necessarily be lame, she was still up eating, but when you laid down and really started to closely look at uh, the feet, you would, you would find, uh, especially in and around the edges, on the bottoms, in between the toes, you'd find some of these lesions. Here's one where the lesion's actually right in the middle, so if you weren't really looking for it closely, you wouldn't have seen that the lesion was right between the two toes. There's another uh, unerupted big old vesicle sitting on the nose of this sow here. Here's a ruptured vesicle, probably just within minutes of taking this picture, you can see where it just looks like a blister that's ruptured, right? You see the rupture there and, and the, uh, the coronary bands and the hoofs are all wet from all the vesicular fluid yet. Lots of virus in that sample. Here's some more of those where this sow had probably been affected for a couple of days. The lesions, those vesicles had ruptured and then now they're starting to heal in and scar over. We looked at taking uh, a bunch of these pigs. We took some from clinically affected litters, some from clinically normal litters, pigs that look perfectly fine. And we went ahead and did some PCR testing here. We bled these, uh, some of these normal ones, some of the affected ones here. We found virus in them both, whether they were from clinically affected litters or not. We also have had just some feces from uh, some other litters, skin, coronary band. It's just about in these cases of these outbreaks on these sow farms, while the duration tends to be really short, we tend to find virus just about everywhere uh, in that farm, in the baby piglets. What was the impact on production? In most of the cases, there were several, there were a couple of exceptions to this, but most of them, if they didn't have a, a, a clostridium or a rotavirus or some other agent causing a lot of problems, it would be a, a temporary, you know, two to five percent increase in pre-wean mortality for a week. Like I said, the clinical tended to be very short, four to seven days, maybe out to ten, and then things would just go right back to normal. So really, it was just more of a pre-weaning impact. Uh, talking to lots of people, looking at some records retrospectively, they didn't really see any impact uh, on conception rate, farrowing rate, litter size uh, at all. So it tends to be just the pre wean mortality impact tends to be pretty short. So what's kind of the current status today? Dr. Sundberg had some information on all the labs. This is from Iowa State specifically. So you can see we started to see cases late in July. You know, started to see the five to 10 cases a week pretty solidly through October. Started to fall off in November. And really, for us, we had uh, one case in the South Farm in December 
uh, the first part of December and we haven't diagnosed any positive cases since then. Now there's still samples being tested here, but all the samples that have been tested here in the last five to six weeks have all come up negative. So very similar to what Dr. Sundberg showed and as Dr. Lynn Harris would say, you know, somewhat similar, although their winters are much different than ours. When they said they got to the winter time of the year, they tended to see a decrease in cases as well. So does that mean it's going to come back next summer when it warms up? Don't know. Certainly we'll be looking for it though. Um, and so we're not sure what this means. This is obviously different than PERS, different than PED, where we tend to see more issues now when it's in the cold. This one's a little bit different. So maybe it says there's a different vector for how that virus gets into those herds. These are a compilation of positive uh, samples from Iowa State University. So this number is going to look a little bit different than uh, Dr. Schmitz because those numbers I showed before, you could have multiple positives from different cases, but that are all from the same farm. So these are just positive samples in a case. You can see it's still pretty much an upper Midwest distribution. Uh, we had a couple of positive samples at Iowa State from, from uh, the southeast, but predominantly Iowa, Missouri, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, uh, kind of the upper Midwest, uh, covers most of the distribution there. This sample this is some really good work by our virologist, Jake Huzang, here at Iowa State University. Taking in some of these cases, they began to sequence, sequence it. And then, so what I'm going to show you here, and my highlighter doesn't work really well, but those ones on the bottom, those are all the old isolates. If you look there, you can see about the fourth slash in is the year that those are isolated. So you see lots of late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, all the current cases are the ones at the top. And you can see, uh, when looking at this, this, what this does is it takes all the DNA, the DNA from from different viruses and it tries to lay them over top of each other to see where are they the same, where are they different. What this is essentially say is that these viruses appear to be for the, the portion of the virus that they sequenced are very different than these old historical isolates. And somewhat close to the Brazilian isolates, much closer to the Brazilian isolates than the old historical isolates. So what does that mean? We're not sure. I mean, one hypothesis would be is, you know, the virus somehow, some ways changed and the change that we've had allows the virus to either persist in the environment longer or makes it more transmissible between herds. Um, so we don't know for sure if that's why we're seeing more cases. All we know is the viruses are certainly different than the viruses that were detected of old. So really, just leaving you with a couple of thoughts, what should you do if you suspect Seneca virus A? So if you see lesions on the nose or the coronary band, once again, make sure you contact your, vet your local veterinarian. They'll work with the state and federal officials. They'll, and they will determine the next course of action because that's where a lot of the questions, well, what do I do? Well, generally, if it looks like a bee, I'd be suspicious. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, through the state and federal vets, they'll, they'll issue somebody to come out and collect those samples. And generally, they'll just kind of ask to quarantine the herd until we get the test back. We want to make sure we're ruling out foot mouth disease and the other uh, exotic vis vesicular diseases. But they'll help. They'll be on the ground to help coordinate that. So a couple of the other messages, just to make sure don't sell those pigs with any active lesions. Make sure they're all recovered and healed. And obviously tested by that time, we'll know it's not foot and mouth or one of the other bad vesicular diseases. And um, if you see an increase in prewean mortality in young pigs, you're seeing whole litters die or lots of pigs die, make sure you're getting diagnostics in. Uh, if you get a diagnosis, I would say make sure you're uh, going back looking for vesicular lesions in those adult animals. If you see them, then contact your state and federal officials because, of course, we want to continue to be vigilant about making sure we rule in Seneca and rule all the other uh, foreign animal diseases out. So certainly we've seen an increase in these idiopathic vesicular diseases that have been Seneca in all cases. We know now that Seneca uh, was probably the definitive cause of the idiopathic vesicular diseases. Uh, we've seen it in sow farms. It tends to cause a short spike in pre-wean mortality in really young pigs, and that's where it's different. It's not wean pigs. It's not even mid-suckling pigs. It's those pigs less than seven days of age. And that was very similar to the clinical picture that... Uh, that our, our colleagues in Brazil uh, saw over the previous year. And we know the virus has changed from historical isolates. We're just not sure all what that means, but it may explain the increases in the number of cases.